Stanford University. So uh, I'm Ben Galbraith. Uh, as Connie mentioned, I do developer relations at Palm uh, and a uh, smattering of other developer related things. How many of you have developed an application before, have experience programming? All right, and the rest of you, uh, how many of you have the intention, or of all of you, how many have the intention of going into industry to develop software someday? And uh, how many of you are, are really excited to develop a mobile application just to make some money kind of on the side? Is that kind of why some of you are here? <laughs> a little bit? All right, uh, great. Well, I hope to get to know more of you and understand sort of what your story is and what you want to get out of this class as time goes on. And uh, really looking forward to spending some time with you. So uh, as Connie and Joe mentioned, I wanted to take a few minutes and sort of set the stage for what we'll be talking about over the next few weeks. And I want to do that by first talking about where we are as an industry. Uh, the remote's working, that's a good sign. So we are at a really interesting time in computing. There's an explosion of mobile devices that, uh, that we're seeing right now. And when you take a step back and think about it, the future is here right now. Like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it's here. Star Trek, it's all here. Um, and for consumers, that presents some really amazing opportunities, and it's only going to get better and better. I mean, you guys have heard all the rumors about devices that are hitting the, the amazing uh, consumer device that's kind of like size like this, and I'm not going to mention by name, is coming out any day now. I mean, this amazing devices are, uh, are here. Um, and it's a fantastic time for consumers. And, and as I just said, it's just going to get better and better and better. For developers, things are uh, not quite as rosy. Um, when you think about the developer experience, you quickly realize that each of these mobile platforms that's emerging, take uh, Apple or Nokia or Android or Palm or Blackberry or some other, like Samsung has a platform, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called Bada, it's this other platform. That's, they're all different. They're, and in many cases, they're all sort of radically different. And as we sort of look at what's happening in the, in the device landscape, if you want to get your application, your experience to a device, it's really kind of painful because you've got to do tremendous work to target more than one vendor's platform. And as an industry, we've kind of been through this before. Um, I'm so sick of people saying before your time, or you probably don't remember this, and now I'm in a position to say this. I can't even believe that. Uh, but you know, before, before your time, um, the world was kind of like this, where we had a soup of PC platforms. Um, and uh, each of these platforms was actually really different. We've been through this. Um, you know, Atari ST. Anyone actually ever use an Atari ST in the room? I didn't. Like, <laughs> anyone under 30 that uses it? Um, like, and this was a confusing mess up until one of the platforms got enough momentum where a virtuous cycle started, or a vicious cycle, depending on your perspective. And uh, they were able to gradually lock out the competition and create a barrier to entry so powerful that all the others that tried really couldn't penetrate that barrier to entry. And even Apple, uh, for most of its life cycle during this period of time, couldn't penetrate any decent share. It just couldn't beat that hegemony that, that formed. And it took the internet to sort of break through that barrier. Um, because up until then, applications were locked into the dominant platform. No one had the time or energy to really target these other minority platforms. They all went for the majority platform. And that's really what happened. And then when the internet came on the scene, all of a sudden, developers had a way to target across multiple platforms and that freed innovation and that freed other platforms to become successful. And when you think about it, all of the powerful software brands that are a part of our lives over the past uh, decade have been manifestations through the web platform and not through uh, any of the individual desktop platforms. So now, as we look at devices, we're seeing this all over again. We're seeing this replayed, and um, we're either going to see the same story happen again, where one or two of these platforms runs away, and we'll have a period of time where innovation will slow down, and a monopoly effect will be created, or we'll find a way to span multiple platforms and free uh, innovation across multiple vendors. Um, and that's sort of the opportunity that a lot of us that, that believe in the web see, because the web is a fantastic way to span all of these emerging mobile devices. And by the way, I don't know if you see the world this way, but mobile devices will shortly converge with desktop computing, and that distinction will just go away. Um, and that, we're just a few years away from that happening. And so, so all these devices will become the new computers. And what's interesting is when you look at these devices, they actually all 
have a really powerful web rendering engine on them right now, right now called WebKit. Um, and even BlackBerry, which has the world's worst browser. Maybe I shouldn't. I'm, <laughs> I'm partisan now. Sorry, I'm used to not working for someone who's got a. BlackBerry's got an interesting browser that's different um, than many of the others. But they've acquired uh, companies that have, uh, black, that have WebKit expertise. And, it, and it's, not, it's not really a secret in industry that, that WebKit's coming to BlackBerry. So as you look at all these different device manufacturers, they all even use the same web rendering engine. Um, there's really only one exception. It's the Nokia Memo platform in Europe that uses Firefox. I used to work for Mozilla, so I, I know this story pretty well. They use mobile Firefox. It used to be called Fennec. Uh, now it's just called Firefox. But by and large, everyone, even Nokia in another division, is using WebKit. So that gives us an enormous opportunity as developers to use the web across these platforms. And so that's really the thesis of the course, and that's what I'll be talking a little bit more about today, and that's what we'll be exploring over the next few uh, weeks together, as how you can use web technologies to effectively create applications that can be deployed across these emerging mobile platforms, so that as a developer, you can reuse your efforts more effectively. Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about write once, run anywhere. Um, that's been uh, something that's been hoped for in our industry, in the software development industry forever. Developers have always wanted the ability to just write code once that just magically runs on any platform. C was going to get us there, by the way. There was Assembler, which is obviously processor specific. And then people said C would get us to cross-platform heaven. And then C++ was going to get us there. And then Java was going to get us there. And I'm not saying that the web is going to get us there. What I am saying is that it takes you a lot further. Um, with the web, it's possible to create 80, 90% of your application in a cross-platform way and then customize the last remaining bits, which is a lot better than, say, creating an application in Objective-C and then starting over and doing it in uh, JavaScript and then starting over and doing it in Java for Android and starting over and doing it in some other variant of C for some other platform. All right. So at Poem, we have this vision in our DNA. We've built our products around the web. But I'm also going to talk to you about how you can target other mobile platforms with web technologies that don't quite have the same vision, because I think you're going to find that the story there is actually really good, too. Before I get into that, I want to talk to you about the web itself. Uh, because you could rightfully kind of look at the web platform and say, well, wait a minute. Why, why, why would I want to use that as the platform that spans devices? Surely, surely there's something different. Like, doesn't Microsoft have Silverlight or Adobe is coming out with this thing called Air? Why don't I use something else? Why is the web the platform that makes sense to span these devices? So I want to spend some time talking about that. Does anyone not understand why this is funny, by the way? If you, so, so you all generally have a web background, enough web background to understand how frustrating CSS can be? That's good. Um, so one of the reasons why I think the web makes a ton of sense is that it's by far the most popular platform the world has ever seen. There's over one and a half billion web clients out there which smokes any other platform, leaves it in the dust, and it's rapidly growing. This is roughly corresponding to market share. Um, but the audience you can target with web technologies is massive. Um, and by consequence of this, there are more web developers than any other platform around. So that's one reason to consider the web being interesting. Um, and you can see properties like the New York Times really sort of embracing the strengths of the web. The web makes text and, and layout of text a joke about how painful CSS is, but if you've tried to lay out text in C++ using um, the tools available to C++ programmers, they're called GUI toolkits or Java or, or whatever, it's real, real pain. Like CSS is nothing compared to the pain you go through. So it's really, really good at this use case. But what about this use case? What about creating really dynamic and, and, um, and um, that's the word I'm looking for, immersive? I think that's the word I'm looking for. Immersive games and things like that. What about non-text use cases? Is the web good for that? Well, I want to I want to sort of give you an update on what's been happening in the web because there's a really interesting story there. The web has been pretty static over the past uh, decade, but it's undergone tremendous innovation over the past few years. And we're sort of at the cusp of a revolution in web technologies. And I want to bring you up to speed on that. By the way, is this format working for you? Should I be tossing more questions out? Are you cool with like the soliloquy up here for a few minutes? Is that I guess you're used to that. Is that kind of what Can people I do? For the end? That's what that's what we're meant to do. That's that's like the etiquette of <laughs> higher. Okay, very good. Uh, if you get bored, just shout out something or raise your hand. Happy to change it up a little bit. But going back to the browser, um, browsers have been evolving really rapidly, and on the surface, they've actually been getting simpler over time. 
Firefox made over the communicator interface and made it really streamlined and consumer friendly. And then Chrome is sort of asking the question, really, do we even need a user interface? Can we just kind of get rid of it all? Um, so browsers seem to be getting simpler, but under the covers, um, there's some fantastic things happening um, that change the game for what's possible on the web. And I want to run you through those. First, let's talk about graphics. So traditionally, the web has been limited to three basic primitives for graphics. Um, text, rectangles, and uh, pre-rendered images. And that's really it. If you go to Gmail today or any other major web property, these are the building blocks. There's really nothing else there. But there's this new technology called Canvas um, that's rolled out to the browsers now that lets you do arbitrary rendering uh, on the client side. Uh, which opens up some really interesting use cases from games in the browser to uh, photo manipulation. And we'll be talking about video later. Uh, there's also uh, sort of boring businessy use cases um, for, for this thing. But uh, this is really sort of changing what we can do in user interfaces. And it's not heavily utilized yet, but it totally opens up what browsers can do. At the same time, there's something called SVG. And I want to talk to you about the difference between these two technologies uh, really quickly. So. Um, so Canvas is entirely code driven. So in other words, it's a way for you to take an element in HTML and using JavaScript, using code, you can tell that element what to draw on itself. And this is an example of how that works. You get the, the element and then you start writing this drawing code. Um, and then it, when you inspect this code at runtime, uh, all you see is just the Canvas element. Um, again, are you guys really, are you comfortable with web development? Do I need to like, anyone, would anyone like more context than I've given so far? Would that make you look stupid in front of your peers if you admitted it? I Should... I'm not even sure where to begin, frankly, though. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, so let me, let, me, let, me run with, let me run with what I've got here. So, so in other words, with Canvas, you kind of do all the code. But if you were to like look at it, there's this tool that lets you look at the, at the interface that you have with the HTML um, while it's there using something called Firebug or Safari Web Inspector. And all you see is this. And that makes a lot of people kind of unhappy because the web has traditionally been about letting you at, at, at runtime while the page is being displayed kind of crack it open and see what's there. And so SVG gives you an alternative where you can also take a graphic like this and if you inspect it, you actually see all the individual shapes that compose that graphic. Now, now, now to me, it's still kind of gobbledygook and I don't know how useful it is, but there are people who just are so happy that that's the case. Um, but from a technical perspective, there, there are other reasons that, we, that we'll go into as time goes on as to why you prefer this. For example, uh, in the Canvas scenario, if you want to like know if someone's clicked in the middle of an image you draw with Canvas, you're just going to have to write that code yourself. You're going to have to do the math to say, like, well, geez, I know that I drew a rectangle here, and I know that that rectangle is 20 pixels wide, and I know they clicked 10 pixels in. So therefore, I know that they, they clicked in the rectangle if I also look at the height and do a similar calculation. Whereas with SVG, you just say, hey, this circle right here, just let me know if they clicked on it. So it's higher level and, and it's easier to code. It's also a lot slower. Um, so that's Canvas and SVG. Those are two great technologies that are finally available in browsers that we can start playing with. Then there's fonts. You know, the web has pretty traditionally been limited to a small set of fonts. Uh, and you can kind of be assured that some small subset of, of all the fonts that you have on your computer are available on everyone's computer. And it's really a small subset. But now, uh, modern browsers let you actually download fonts cross-browser to the user. So finally, you have the ability to have really interesting typography in browsers. And in fact, um, some browsers actually have better typography than like Photoshop baked in. Uh, so really, really great typography is now available. It's kind of a complicated story when you dig into the details because IE has a different font format than WebKit, than Safari, and Firefox support, and Chrome, and and, uh, and then the companies that produce fonts have different licensing approaches. So there are services like Typekit that just abstract all those details away. And all you have to do is say, hey, I want to use that font. And then it just gives you like a little piece of code you embed and you're done. So fonts. So first we have amazing graphics that are available in browsers. Now we have great typography. Um, I want to talk to you about something else that's graphical related. I, I don't have an internet connection in here yet. We'll work that out. Otherwise, I'd show you these demos live. So I'm showing you some videos um, of 3D graphics. And again, the lighting isn't ideal. Sorry about how it's all washed out. But now browsers have the ability to do 3D graphics at really high frame rates uh, right in the browser. And this is really exciting stuff. Um, and we now have the ability to have these 3D graphics cleanly composited on top of the web page so you can mix the content together. I don't have a video that shows that. 
Um, and I want to show you another uh, 3D demo. The frame rates on this are a little low in my captured video. If I actually showed you a demo, it would be smooth as butter at 60, 70 fips, uh, frames per second. So just take my word for it. Um, Gosh, I wish, I wish we had that internet connection. That's too bad. Um, but uh, the difference between these two demos, this demo is using something called WebGL. Have you guys heard of OpenGL? Can anyone explain to me what OpenGL is comfortably? This is my lame attempt at interaction. Yeah. Basically, like, directory, it's... Uh, oh, that yeah. hurts. Did Microsoft, <laughs> <laughs> did Microsoft pay for one of your classes? No, <laughs> No, no, that's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. That's a fair statement. I'm definitely in no, that's, that's a fair statement. No, yeah, it's like Direct 3D. That's right. That's right. Uh, so um, the real trick to getting performance in computing is to have the hardware do all the work for you. And so OpenGL is a language that the industry has agreed on that says, hey, if you represent 3D graphics in this language, there are some chips that a lot of computers have that'll do all that calculation for you and make it go amazingly fast. If you don't use the hardware, then the software's got to do it. The software's got to tell the graphics card how to draw the pixels. And the minute you do that, you're talking orders of magnitude uh, slower. And so OpenGL is this industry agreed upon dialect. There's another one called Direct3D that's promoted by a single vendor that has a lot of popularity. Um, and WebGL is a way to bridge that to JavaScript developers so that JavaScript developers can give the hardware that supports OpenGL those graphical instructions, and it results in great, great performance. The problem with WebGL is it's a whole other technology. It's not HTML and CSS. It's OpenGL, but represented in a JavaScript-y way. This demo is just CSS. Um, and you can use some JavaScript to configure it. But it's, it's sort of the web developer version. And it gives you very similar performance. And so this is at least as exciting as the other demo but, because you can take existing web pages and sprinkle in the CSS stuff, and you can create amazing interactions. And on mobile devices that support this stuff, you get similar frame rates and similar performance. It's really pretty impressive. So have you guys used websites that look like this? Really? What websites have you used that like do all these fancy 3D graphics? Cool Iris. Cool Iris. That actually does it through Flash. Um, and it's not this cool. It's not this cool, if you grant me that. It's not, it's not, well, again, this video is choppy and stuff. When I show you the real thing in a future instantiation of the class. Anyone else use a website that uses this stuff? Uh, this stuff hasn't hit the mainstream, uh, why I ask that question. And it's tremendously exciting to me because it's an opportunity that all of you guys have to start creating the next generation of websites that take advantage of this because most of the industry doesn't even know this stuff's possible. Consumers certainly don't have the expectation that browsers can do this. And so the next wave of startups, the next wave of companies that embrace these technologies will revolutionize the industry, will result in acquisitions and successful businesses. And this stuff's just sitting there uh, waiting to be utilized. So that's graphics. Um, so any application has a couple of parts. There's the user interface. And then there's what happens when the user interacts with that interface, the logic of the application. The logic is driven by the, the, the programming language that, that backs the interface. JavaScript is that, is that language for the web. And in the past, JavaScript has been kind of this slow toy. Well, it turns out over the last few years, the performance of JavaScript has increased, in some cases, over 100 times. Uh, it turns out all the major browsers, uh, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Opera, and IE9, which I don't have on this slide, all have amazing next generation JavaScript runtimes. And uh, there's an interesting article um, in Time or Newsweek or Wired or somewhere by this guy named Stephen Levy, who's a, who's a famous tech columnist. When, when Google Chrome came out, he kind of had this quote that I love. He said that when, when you've improved something's performance by an order of magnitude, by 10x, you haven't created something better. You've created something new. And we've seen two orders of magnitude, 100x improvements in JavaScript performance in just a few years. That opens up immense possibilities that, again, are largely untapped. Um, and so that's another piece of the web stack that's, that's evolved. I want to get a little geeky with you and talk about one of the major changes that's just happened in JavaScript runtimes. So if you're a programmer and you're using a language like C or C++ or weird object-oriented variants of C on mobile platforms, um, you spend a lot of your time managing memory yourself. Um, and, uh, and when you get this wrong, you create really annoying bugs and performance hangups for your users. And a lot of software developers spend a lot of their time doing this. JavaScript and other higher level languages manage memory for you, but it comes with a cost. And the cost is this. 
uh, the way all these systems work is they have this area for data called the heap usually. And um, your data is packaged up as individual objects and eventually you'll fill up this area. And so when that happens, your program's execution is stopped while a process goes through and analyzes all the memory you've used to figure out, okay, how much of that memory is still being used and how much of that memory is no longer being used and can be reclaimed. If it's all still being used, game over. You run out of memory and you're dead. Um, so typically what happens is you find stuff, memory that can be reclaimed and the execution goes again. So if you've ever used a higher level language like JavaScript or Java or another language and you see these pauses in execution, pauses in the animation, it's not, it's not totally smooth, it's because of this process. It's known as garbage collection. JavaScript has used this model for ages. Well, it turns out there's a simple solution that works really well. It's called generational garbage collection. It's where you take this area of memory and you split it up. And it's based on the observation that most programs create a lot of data and then only retain a small percentage of it. And so if you optimize for that use case, you create a small space. It's usually called an Eden uh, or a young generation or a, there's another term for it. But those terms will do. Uh, you create like an Eden, uh, young space, nursery. Nursery is the other term. And um, you pause the, the program's execution, uh, but you only go through this, this sort of nursery. It's a much smaller space, dramatically smaller space in reality. And that lets you pause the execution of the program for much smaller lengths of time, which means that these pauses are imperceptible. And the data that survives in this nursery, you move to this older generation. And it turns out you only have to go through this older generation for much, uh, uh, much less frequently. And so uh, I just wanted to cover that optimization because um, this is fairly new in JavaScript runtimes. And it illustrates that these problems that we've been having in performance classically in web applications are going away if they haven't already disappeared. Uh, by the way, I like to make snide comments about other platforms, but really I, I, I don't mean anything by it. If you're, if you're I'm not trying to pick a fight, and I actually really love our competitors' platforms too, so I'm not, anyway, I'm not, not that part of some. So um, I want to show you something else. So no matter how fast we get with JavaScript, no matter how fast uh, JavaScript is, there's always going to be a task that lasts longer than, uh, or, well, let me take a step back. So, how long do you think a process can go before the user notices? Like, for example, if, uh, you, if you froze an application for a period of time, how long do you have before the user notices that that application is paused? A second? Two seconds? Half a second? How long do you think you have? Anyone? Anyone know? Tenth of a second. That's a great answer. Uh, anywhere between a twentieth of a second and a tenth of a second. Not very long. If an application freezes for more than a tenth of a second, so there's a famous scientist uh, guy by the name of Jacob Nielsen who asserts that if a program is paused for longer than a tenth of a second, the user loses flow. The user loses this sense that the, the program is just an extension of his self. And if, the, and if the program's execution pauses for longer than a second, the user starts to get pissed off. It's not what he said. It's not quite his language, but that's essentially what he means. The user starts to get ticked off. Um, and so you really don't have very much time. And so um, you can avoid pausing an application for longer than a tenth of a second by making the engine, the JavaScript runtime or whatever programming language you're using, you can, you can speed those up. That's one way. But eventually you're going to have something that's just going to take longer than a tenth of a second. There's nothing you can do about it. There's plenty of computer science calculations that are just going to take a long time, even if you had like 10 cores. So um, what happens then? Well, in JavaScript, this is what happens. We're doing an image manipulation operation in the browser, and uh, the browser becomes locked up while we're doing this. You really can't do anything. And eventually what happens is you'll get this dialog that says, ooh, the script has become unresponsive. Have, it, have any of you seen this in the wild? Has this happened to you? And you just have to say, it's kind of a terrible user experience. And then finally, the operation finishes. Well, why is this? It's because when this typically happens in an application, you, uh, you create a background thread and you offload that operation that has uh, the potential to last longer than a tenth of a second off to a background thread. And the background thread goes and does that while, the, while the, the main user interface continues to remain responsive. That's how you solve that problem in general. But in browsers, there's no threading. There's no notion of threads. And so browsers have always been limited in what we've been able to do on the browser because otherwise you're going to lock it up and you're going to have to present that dialogue to the user at some point and it's just going to be a bad experience. Well, there's a new technology called web workers that actually let us push background operations 
off of the UI thread. And uh, I have a demo that shows this. It's really cool. But uh, I think we actually went worse now. Uh, I'll show you a demo next time, I guess. Um, but, um, but web workers give us this new ability to do operations in the background. And that's really, really cool. So that's another new capability that browsers now have that they haven't had before. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, databases. So browsers in the past haven't had a way to really store data efficiently on the client, um, on the browser. You've always had to go back to the server to get data. Uh, you've had cookies, but cookies are very limited in both the size of the data that you can store and also how you can query that data. And browsers are now getting a variety of different technologies that let you store large amounts of data and store it in a structured way. Most of the browsers have just gone down and packaged SQLite. It's a database engine just embedded it in the browser. Mozilla and IE think that's a really bad idea, and so they're pursuing their own versions of database technologies. And so this is kind of a murky area, but it's, it's uh, there's, with local storage, which is broadly implemented, you still at least have the ability to do uh, large amounts of data. So, I've talked about a lot of different technologies, and uh, hopefully I haven't gone too deep, and for those of you who thought I didn't go deep enough, I'm sorry, we'll do that later. Um, but these are all sort of collectively packaged up and known as HTML5. HTML5 is a marketing term, really. Um, HTML5, the spec, or there's a document somewhere that says this is what HTML5 is, and it's really boring, and it doesn't have half the stuff that I talked to you about. But whenever you hear Google executives talk about HTML5, or marketing people, or anyone in the press, and they say HTML5, they're talking about all the stuff that I just talked about, all of these new technologies that are coming to browsers. And so it turns out the HTML5 platform is really exciting and enables a lot of these new use cases that just haven't been possible on the web before. And so what this, what this enables is this evolution that we've been seeing about what the web is over the past few years. Like 10 years ago, um, when Joe was young, um, the web was all about uh, a server serving an application to a client and all the web browser could do was just have like these little dumb forms, like form fields that you'd fill in. And that was really it. It didn't really have much logic there. <laughs> yeah, those are, Amazon was great back then. Yeah, it was uh, back in the Yahoo heyday. Um, Ajax, over the past five to six years, has sort of shaken things up by introducing some business logic and some application logic um, on the client. There's, there's kind of a distinction here. I don't know that it's important to get into. But basically, the client can do more. And instead of the server serving up the entire application and the browser just saying, hey, I don't even know what's going on. I'm just going to render this thing. Um, you see a lot of web pages actually taking data from the server and being really smart about that data, looking at the data, parsing it, and figuring out what to do all on the client. And this is all evolving to where the web is heading now, where the servers are really just becoming dumb. The servers are just sending data, and the client is really where all the action's happening. And on the browser, the client, you're actually taking this data and you're doing the application right there on the client. Uh, so, that, so the web browser is becoming really, really interesting. There's also another kind of interesting trend in the web that's riding in parallel on this. Um, we've seen a lot of interesting applications over the past few years that, um, that are really rich and engaging. Google Docs, uh, Gmail, the 37 Signals stuff. Um, there's another company called 280 North that's doing some great stuff. There's a lot of interesting websites out there, but we're seeing this sort of evolution of the web sort of going to the desktop and really sort of breaking out of the browser's constraints. The browser is what we call a sandbox, where the browser sort of doesn't let applications do a lot. Like uh, a web page can't access Bluetooth. It can't, uh, um, without a lot of help, play sound. Uh, you have to use a plugin for that. It can't get to your local files uh, very easily. You can use plugins for that, but natively it can't do that. Um, up until recently, it couldn't get to your GPU. It can't get to your address book. There's a lot that it can't do, but there are a lot of technologies that are sort of blowing this up and turning web pages into desktop applications. And on the desktop, we're seeing this trend uh, a lot with technologies like Fluid and Mozilla Prism and Adobe Air and Upseller and Titanium. So we're seeing these applications explode. But what's really exciting is that in mobile, we're seeing this trend accelerated even further. And at Palm, we've taken web applications and blown them up out of the sandbox and basically said that web applications are native applications. Like, in fact, all of, all of the native applications on the Palm device are web applications, and they can do everything that any application can do. And these are two key technologies that do the same for other platforms, Accelerator, Titanium, and PhoneGap. 
Um, and these technologies let you, for example, take web technologies and package them up and use them as a native application on the iPhone or on Android uh, or uh, BlackBerry and other platforms. And so uh, these technologies are really exciting because they basically take a native application shell and embed WebKit inside of them along with your application and make them into a native app. Um, and so, they're, they're, so this, this other trend is that this sandbox that web apps have been trapped inside that have constrained what web apps can do is being blown up and web applications are finally being exposed to the actual uh, full operating system and lets you do some really exciting things. So the question then becomes, how do you deploy web applications to users? So the traditional model for web applications is through the web. You just go to use your browser, you type in a URL, boom, you're at the application. But we've seen application marketplaces really take off over the past few years in a big, big way. And these distribution channels are totally different. You go to a store, you search for an application, or you, you uh, look at like a list of best hits, and you grab the app, and you download it, and you install it. Um, and so what model is going to win? Um, HTML5 introduces a bunch of features that let you discover an application over the web and actually install that application so that it becomes a native application on the device. You don't even have to use a catalog. Is that going to win? Or is this catalog channel going to continue to win? I don't really know what the answer is there. But it's interesting to see that dichotomy. Um, and in fact, if you look at mobile devices today, it's kind of a blur right now. Because it, this is, on the left, Gmail, accessed through the browser. And on the right is the native uh, email client on, uh, on the Palm device. And it's not readily apparent which one is more native than the other. After a while, when you use it, you kind of get a sense for it. But these things are converging. So that's an interesting trend. Another interesting trend is figuring out what to do with the user interface. Because as you start to create a web application and you want it to work across multiple devices, well, what do you want it to look like? If you're targeting uh, the iPhone, that's got a very distinctive look and feel. Palm has a distinctive look and feel. And so a lot of people create interfaces like this that just say that to hell with the native UI, I'm just going to do something cool. Uh, and it's going to look good no matter where, where I run it. And this is kind of a classic problem that the industry's faced because people have tried to do cross-platform development forever. And there's always been this raging debate about do you make it look just like the native operating system or do you make it look cool no matter what the native operating system is so you don't even deal with that. Um, and it's, we'll, we'll always have to deal with this question. So that's a key design question. Um, another issue as we talk about mobile is understanding how to take advantage of the unique affordances that mobile gives you. For example, there's an application on the iPhone called Tweety that when you refresh, you drag it down and, and, and it refreshes instead of having a refresh button. And on the Palm, one of the things you'll see is that we use gestures a lot. Um, and so instead of having buttons for back, for example, there's a gesture you do to go back. Um, and there's a ton of other ways that you can incorporate gestures. So that's an interesting, oh, no, there's an animation. So that's an interesting question is um, what design differences come with mobile? And part of that is also keyboard. Some mobile platforms have hardware keyboards, some don't. Um, and uh, there's a bunch of other ways to design for mobile. We'll get into that more. So um, I want to wrap up my presentation by just saying that this is, again, as I started out by saying, a really exciting time. Uh, mobile is changing everything. And there's a lot of mobile platforms out there. I believe strongly that the web makes complete sense as a platform that spans the mobile platforms. And I'm really excited to work with Palm, a company that's bet on the web and said that the web makes sense as a native platform. And so over the next few weeks, we want to talk to you about how you can use web technologies effectively to create mobile applications. And uh, we'll focus a lot of our time and energy on how this works on the Palm platform. Uh, we'll also spend some time talking about how you can deploy applications to other platforms too. And uh, is it, this is when I'm supposed to wrap up, right? 4.15? Okay. And do I have time for Q&A too? Did I yeah. burn through? Fantastic. So I, I ended when I'm supposed to, yeah. right? OK. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. So uh, are there any questions? Why don't we, uh, go oh, yeah. Syllabus. syllabus. Weeks, and then we're jump into OK. So, uh, so today was this web vision for mobile. Um, and we thought it would make sense in the next class to sort of go deeper in web technologies. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was an overview, but really to talk about how they work and uh, how these HTML5 technologies work and really how these advanced web technologies uh, can be used inside of an application. So that's what we're going to do next time. 
After that, we're going to talk about user experience and design, how, how you can create a compelling application from a design perspective. And then after that, we're going to dive into actually building an application using WebOS. Then we're going to talk about uh, game-specific stuff. Then we're going to talk about how we can take all these skills and apply them to other platforms. I'm looking at week eight. Then at week nine, uh, we're going to talk about um, how you can actually take these apps and effectively market them and make money with them. And then the week after that, we're going to go into looking at applications that you guys have created. And uh, as Connie said, uh, talk about your applications in front of the group, or if you'd rather do that uh, in a different setting, that's fine too. So um, did I do a good job of that? Happy? Yeah. Yeah? All right. All right. Great. Now, uh, questions? Yeah. Um, so you were talking about HTML5. I was wondering if um, the Palm platform has video. Uh, yeah. So the latest release of WebOS, uh, WebOS 1.4, has HTML5 video. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so I understand advantages of having kind of a web platform as your application development platform. Yeah. Um, but given that the main advantage or the main like appeal to a developer is distribution, yeah. and that the iPhone and the Android have just like a larger distribution like you know base than the Palm. Yeah. What is kind of your developer strategy in trying to get people to develop on your platform then, other than that? A couple of different strategies. Um, the first strategy is really what I've been talking about here. It's um, using web technologies as a way to write an application once that can be deployed to iPhone, that can be deployed to Android, that can be deployed to Palm, that can be deployed to BlackBerry and other platforms. So um, that appears to the user just as immersive and engaging as a native application. So if your intent is to create a 3D game, web's not there yet. Uh, we'll talk about WebGL. It's exciting. It's on the horizon. Uh, it's on our roadmap at Palm. I'm not sure when exactly we're going to ship it, but it's coming. And if you're trying to target the future with, with the web, man, go for it. Because when WebGL hits, and it's already in some browsers, and it will be in other browsers, and it's coming to mobile platforms, you'll be well positioned, and you're going to be ahead of the game. Uh, but if you want to do a, a 3D game today, there's another technology stack we have called the PDK, the Plugin Development Kit that lets you use OpenGL directly, and, it, and you can create applications that target iPhone and Palm really easily. A lot of developers do it. Really exciting, great opportunity, different set of technologies. Uh, if you want to create ca more casual games or 2D type games or business applications or utility applications, web's a fantastic stack for that. And uh, in other classes, I'll actually walk you through iPhone applications that are really popular, really successful, that are created using web technologies, uh, but appear to the user just as cool as other native uh, Objective-C applications on that platform. But, but we still have to go through kind of the browser to get to them. Uh, no. So uh, let, me, uh, let me hit this. Let me go over here and just go to the slide navigator. Do, 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 do. So um, these technologies, Accelerator, Titanium, and PhoneGap, what they do is they actually, they've created that native application for you. So they create a native application shell that embeds WebKit. And so you use these technologies, and it, it, it's like you just package it up, and it is a native application. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry that I kind of lost over that a little bit. Okay. So that's our first strategy, I think is to show developers how you can target multiple platforms using web technologies so that you can actually have a better experience with your investment. Uh, to your second question, that's a great question. So there's no getting around that iPhone has massive deployment, right? And um, relative to Palm, I'm just going to say they've sold more devices than we have up to now. They got a head start. They've sold more devices. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no, no, it's not questionable. They have. <laughs> Whether or not it's because we got a head start or not, well, yeah, we'll save that for another day. Um, so, um, so they have a larger addressable market. Um, the problem for developers is the size of their application marketplace. So Apple, Apple uh, advertises uh, the size of their marketplace a lot. I think it's like 200,000 200, applications now. What is it? 150,000, 200,000, 300,000? Is it a million now? <laughs> the number's like, whew. Um, that's actually um, really bad for developers um, because how are people going to discover your application? And in fact, uh, as you talk to developers, I read skepticism on your face. <laughs> but, but uh, well, I mean, let's take it to basics. Like, um, if, if you wanted to market your applications and you had, to, you had an opportunity to market it in a store that has five competitive offerings or 500,000 competitive offerings, which are you going to take? Well, if the 500,000 had, you know, five million people versus 
5,000 people on the other one. And that's the question. What's the ratio of competition in the marketplace to buyers? And how does that work? And I think the point that we make is that there's a relationship between those two numbers and you have to look at both. The size of the application marketplace and the size of the addressable market of consumers. And the point that I'd make to you is iPhone has a ton of, people, ton of consumers of the platform. They also have a massive amount of competition in the marketplace. And it's really difficult for you to stand out. And so the question is how many of those consumers are gonna buy your wares versus someone else's? And so it turns out that as long as you have a certain critical mass in the marketplace, the numbers don't really, like it doesn't really matter if there's a billion iPhones because if there's you know, 100 million competing applications, you still have the same ratios as you would at like a million consumers and a thousand competitors. So that's, when we get to the business session, we can talk more about the specifics. Joe will come prepared with all the numbers that he can and dive into that. Um, but from a high level, that's how I'd address those two points. Is that, yeah, that makes sense. does that Doc Hunt to a degree? Okay, all right. Um, let's go over here first and then back there. Yeah? Um, I mean, just to get a kind of a feel of like Palm as a, a smartphone, um, how many developers do you guys have and how many like applications are running in your market and how many users do you have of your platform? Um, That's because I'm, I'm an Android developer, so I have kind of yeah, a yeah. sense of that, but I haven't really done much with Palm. Yeah, good question. So on Palm, we have, uh, I think, a little over 2,200, 2,300 applications in the marketplace and about 1,000 developers in the developer program. We have something like 22,000 developers who kind of hang out and around 1,000 developers who have actually signed up to distribute applications through the marketplace. And um, uh, to give you a sense of timeline, we just launched our developer program at CES, which was uh, early January. So um, it's actually pretty good, That's given the short amount of time that it opened for business. So it sounds like, just from, uh, from the questions I'm getting, it sounds like maybe it might be useful to accelerate where we have the business presentation in the syllabus. Is that like, do you guys have a lot of burning questions around that, or are you more focused on technology? Would you like, would you like us to like give you a deep dive on the business side earlier in the syllabus than we do now? I'm just reacting to the fact that two yeah. of the questions have been business focused. Well, I mean, we could do that. Yeah, we can do offline questions or Q&A. True, true, true. Totally, yeah. Well, I, think, I think also the, the class, I mean, uh, the, you know, the smartphone business hasn't been around that long. And, uh, and so I think contextually, this, this class is about, you know, we thought about, you know, is it all just about Palm or is it about the web in general? And this is very much a class about mobile applications using web technologies. And Palm is an example of that, right? So, so like Ben said, we're going to be looking at cross-platform tools. We'll definitely talk about, uh, we, we think this is a way that mobile applications are going to be developed regardless of what platform. Right. So that, that, that point should be, should be clear. That's, so we're not just talking about Palm stuff here. We want, it's, a, it's a broader context. So does that make sense? Yeah. So for the, for the video, in other words, this is a class about web technologies to mobile. Palm was one example. Target other platforms. And I totally get your questions because from a developer perspective, it's really about the return on the investment of time and energy you put into it. And, uh, and that's a huge part of the equation. And we're really focused on providing a great environment and a great experience for that too. Any other questions? Yeah, you had, you had your hand up? Okay. Yeah. All okay. right. Um, so, so you're talking about how, like, on a computer, your browser is kind of a sandbox, and that's kind of uh, one of one of the big advantages of working with your mobile web OS. That the web can like interact with all your local files and all that stuff. So, as I understand it, like, so Google, for example, is trying to make their Chrome OS or whatever, and is trying to make your make your 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 desktop experience centered around the use of a browser. So, I, I don't know, like, wait, what was your what would be your opinion on that with regards to the statements that you made? Mm -hmm. And how would that impact the further development of like web OSs with like say like the Palm Pre or other mobile technologies? Yeah, so um, I'm really excited to see another entrant in the market like Chrome OS that embraces the web as the native platform of the OS. And so um, the details of Chrome OS I think are still largely pending as that product comes to market. But it's another example of this trend of the web breaking out of the sandbox and becoming the native environment of an operating system. So uh, I think it dovetails really well with this message, and uh, it's really exciting. Is that? Did yeah, I get your yeah, question? Yeah, that, that, that works. Okay. Yeah. What are the privacy implications of 
the web, I guess, like invading your computer almost, like, and, yeah. like so uh, privacy implications, uh, what's the security model? So this is uh, a really good question. Um, so that's actually the primary gateway that I think blocks um, this world from really coming to fruition. So I talked earlier about how there's this model of applications that you purchase through a store that are deployed to your device and are sort of in a whole other world than the web. The reason why this isn't ready yet uh, for the same types of applications here is because browsers haven't worked out how to do this. And this is an area that Mozilla is actively researching. It's an area that Google is actively researching with Chrome. It's how do we ask the user to give a web page permission to break out of the sandbox. Until we solve the permissioning problem, this is largely going to continue to be constrained in the sandbox. And that's why these technologies that I was illustrating uh, a little earlier that break out of the sandbox, do it the way they do. All these technologies take web pages outside of the sandbox by creating an actual application that you download. Like Adobe Air, what it does, well, let's focus on Accelerator Titanium because Air is both about Flash and the web and it makes this conversation a little ambiguous. Accelerator Titanium is this technology for the desktop that lets you take a web page and package it up as a desktop application and the model of the desktop application world is really weird. It's like if you download a desktop application and install it, you've given it access to do anything in the world. Like it could do anything to your computer. It could like go through your personal files, grab them, send them to China or Japan or Russia or, or you know, Tacoma. Um, and by virtue of like downloading the application, you've given it every privilege in the world, basically. Um, and so the desktop permissioning model is also broken, but we've, we kind of are used to it. And so um, I'm actually kind of excited that the web has to solve this problem because it really needs to be solved for both desktop and web applications. We really need a model that basically lets you as a user say or understand what that application wants to do with your data and your computer and your hardware and lets you give it permission. And we need a model that isn't presenting a modal dialogue to the user every time the application wants to do something. Because that doesn't scale, it's obnoxious, no one wants that. So what is the model? Is it like a checklist that you like look at every time you launch an application and you kind of audit? Would your mom understand what that works? Is it social, where you launch an application and it says, well, this application is going to do a lot of things, but your five best friends and your brother and your father trust it, so you should probably trust it too. Is that the model? That would probably work best for my mom. She booted it up and she says, well, is my, does my son use this? Yes, he does. Oh, well, then okay. I'll, I'll let it. So is it more social? Uh, is it some other model? And so that's sort of what we're grappling with. In the meantime, the way that we give web applications augmented access is by letting them masquerade as desktop applications because that model is established and there's precedent there. Has that kind of answered your question? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that makes, that makes sense for the desktop, but you said that like the webOS has pretty much everything in like a web kind of interface. So how yeah. exactly does like the system configuration break out of yeah, yeah, to yeah. So, 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 could I generalize your question and just say I understood what you said for desktop? How does that apply to mobile? Yeah. Is that kind of your question? So, uh, mobile world is a little different. Um, actually, the mobile world has a different set of precedents. Um, the precedent that Apple set, because they were really the first mover into this world of desktop as a mobile device, really before Apple smartphones were were a different beasts. They were kind of different. Apple was the first person to sort of take a desktop class operating system and shove it into a browser. The precedent that Apple set was to basically say, we're going to give a sandbox to, to applications, but it's going to be a more permissive sandbox than the browser. Um, it's not as permissive as the old desktop model, but it's more permissive than the web, and this is the new world. That's why for developers it was so controversial when the iPad chose um, the iPhone operating system instead of desktop OS X, because it chose that sandbox instead of the wild, wild west version of desktop computing. And so at Palm, and, and largely all the other mobile vendors have sort of followed that same precedent of presenting mobile applications which are with a more permissive sandbox than, uh, than the web sandbox, but not letting mobile applications go everywhere they want to. Um, and this kind of fits with user expectations because you've got all your personal data on the mobile device and you always want it to work. And so it's just not acceptable to download some teenager's application that's a cool game but happens to have been poorly written and guess what, deleted your phone stack. I mean, that's, it's just not acceptable. And so that's why mobile devices have a different set of permissions than desktop. So it's largely the same story, just a different sandbox. 
the large story, uh, same story as the browser, just an expanded sandbox. Does that make sense? Okay. What are the questions? Yeah. What are the shortest questions? Does it support Flash? Does WebOS support Flash? WebOS, uh, how do I answer that question, Joe? Okay. Uh, sorry. So, uh, flash support is coming. We can say that. It is coming. Definitely. Um, do you have a follow up question about flash or anything like that? No, I'm like, I feel like Apple doesn't support flash yet, so I think it's not a very bad thing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, does the Flash support Flash development have, kit have like, um, a widget set, or is it pretty much you're just do whatever you want with JavaScript and CSS? Good question. There's really a couple of different models. Um, there, uh, on, on our platform, you can actually just create a web page the same way you would on the desktop and use that web page the same way that you create a web page, and it's the same story as the web, uh, and you can do that. Um, but we also have a web-based UI toolkit that gives you components, and those components, um, and also some augmented behaviors above what the web gives you, and those components and augmented behaviors are implemented using web technologies. You just go down a different path to use them. And it's not dramatically different. It's just you include our libraries, and then you use our style sheets and things like that to get those components. So if you want to create something that works across browsers and, and uses web technologies and, and blah, 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 you can do that. If you want to take advantage of what we have in order to get there faster, you can do that too. Does that make sense? We'll talk more about that in, I think, the third or fourth week. What are the questions? Yeah. So I'm feeling like I, I took CS106A, but then I withdrew because I was cramming with all these other classes. I thought I could take it on with tons of other classes, underestimated how hard it was. And so I haven't taken much programming, but yeah. I have a lot of uh, business ideas and like other application ideas for this class. Do you think that it would be in my interest to take this class or get some other uh, background in, in, uh, in programming before I try to take this class again. I already have a lot of ideas that just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. What programming background do you have, if any? Uh, I've only really programmed with HTML, C++, and a little bit of Java. Okay. What, uh, I don't know if I'm being too specific here, but what have you done with Java? What have you done with C++? Well, when I, I only did C++ a little bit in high school for a couple classes. Yeah, the yeah, main yeah. thing is HTML. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. My most recent, the thing I have most in my uh, most recent memory. So. Okay. Um, well, let me just ask you a quick question. I think this will kind of serve others who may be in the same boat. Like, um, the only code snippet I really have at the ready is this right here. Like, um, does, this, does this intimidate you? <laughs> no, and, and I, asked that, I asked that in like a, I mean, study that for a second. Like, do you look at that and say, ah, uh, hell if I know. Or do you look at that and say, I kind of know what's going on? I kind of know what's going on. Yeah, I think you'd probably do OK. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand like, how the different languages work. I just don't know the details, the different like, yeah. commands and things like that specifically. I've, I've lost, a lot, of the, I've yeah. lost a lot of the details by so, um, very much. Did we lose the JavaScript? We talked about doing a JavaScript thing. Did we lose that? Still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the web skills. So yeah, the next class. I think we'll do a pretty good job of taking you through the foundation of stuff that you need to know um, in order to really progress. The web is designed for you. It's not designed for C and C++ developers. In fact, when C and C++ developers try to create complex web applications, it can be a disaster because they overcomplicate it. They, they, they feel like they have to do things that they don't really have to do. For example, you spend a lot of time in C and C++ designing for thread safety. But you don't need to design for thread safety in the web. In fact, it's counterproductive if you do that. Um, and so uh, I think you should go for it. Uh, I think you'd, you'd probably do fine. We'll also have recommended reading and substitute questions. Because I'm not really familiar with JavaScript. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Java, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Sure, sure. We'll, we'll have recommended reading lists we'll, and more we'll, handouts to we'll, about we'll, it. We're reading those slides and some. Uh, some uh, we talked about doing that. Uh, so Douglas Crockford has a Yahoo course, and I don't have an internet connection, so I don't think I can. I'm told. Actually, if you guys just um, send in your application to us by Monday, I'll be emailing you guys to let you know you're enrolled in the class. 
And in that email include links on how to get to all these other resources we're talking about. Oh man, my, my, my quick's over. So, uh, oops, it is. So, just Google this guy, Douglas Crockford, great guy. Um, he just did some lectures for Yahoo and Yahoo that uh, talk about JavaScript and uh, sort of origins of JavaScript and how you can be effective with JavaScript. That's uh, a great video series to watch that can kind of prep you uh, for what we're going to be talking about in the next week. What other questions do you have? Yes. Do, does like the Palm Pre and any of the other devices you guys have um, have hardware GPUs and? Absolutely. So um, definitely. So um, we basically have two software stacks that we expose to developers. One is the web stack and the other is uh, C, C++, OpenGL stack. Both stacks technically, I mean, could access the GPU. Right now we don't have the web stack exposed to the GPU. We've announced that that's on our roadmap. We just haven't announced when uh, at some point. We will release uh, uh, support for technologies like CSS transforms that I showed you with that wall of pictures and WebGL that let web applications utilize the GPU. For the PDK, for the C, C++, OpenGL stack, yeah, you can do that today. In fact, um, you know, I, we have, a few of us have Palm devices. I think we're going to bring some in. You can actually use those 3D uh, the devices to play like 3D games that use the GPU aggressively. Um, so yes. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. I think we're out of time, so I'm going okay. to ask Joe to um, pick the best question and pass out our book. Uh, well, I, I like your privacy question. It's kind of a broad question, uh, so we, uh, but it's a good topic. So <laughs> you made the, uh, thank you. <laughs> the book. It was a good follow-up, so I almost gave it to you. But it was, uh, <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, remember to get your application in to Angela and Conrad by Saturday. I will be emailing you on Monday for the people who are officially on the course. But again, if you aren't on that social list, feel free to audit any of the classes. And feel free to the application. We'll definitely give you feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.